one of my biggest challenges has been that I don't feel I've had the economy as a tailwind, as a CEO, for the last five years. It's actually been a headwind for a while. It's a headwind in some region or the other even now. But it's been buffeting more. That's the better description. Not a headwind, not a tailwind. It's a buffeting wind. And that's the biggest challenge for a company today. You look at uh, what's going on right now. Foreign exchange. Uh, you've got the dollar very strong. The euro and the real and the Australian dollar have all weakened. By 18, 20% in the last eight, 10 months. So if you're lapping and comparing, companies like ours, you're taking seven, eight, 10 percentage points of revenue growth off the top, just for comparison. So if you look at an XFX, it's fine. The underlying business dynamics are what they are. But if you're a shareholder, XFX ain't a great deal. You want your money in your pocket. And that's a difficult circumstance. Similarly for oil prices, all the big energy companies, chemical companies, they're all reeling with the change in oil prices. So it's a really interesting question you're asking. And it's got this dynamic of buffeting winds as compared to consistent headwinds that seem to be turning to tailwinds in previous recessions. This has been like a, you know, the gift that keeps on giving in a way. And not a good word, but that's the way it is. If you are in a growth industry, which is what I believe ours is, where 85% of the world's retail transactions are still in cash or check, so when you're in an industry where your runway for growth is the 85% of the marketplace that you haven't even touched, let alone the growth of that marketplace as people consume more and more people become middle class and their spending increases. Forget that. Just what they're spending today. If they didn't change that for the next 10 years, 85% of that market is untouched. Now it varies by country and by region and by development and by culture, but it's 85%. So you're in a growth industry, whichever way you look at it. The temptation to keep trying to grow in that industry and keep investing in all the things that would drive growth and change patterns is very strong. Challenges, revenue tends to have a different time series than expenses. And my joke normally is that expenses are a reality and revenue is a nice to have. So if you're navigating your way through a complicated currency environment with a complicated economic environment, it means you've got to temper even your ambitions in a growth industry. So there are two parts to that. There's the what you get out of where they're living, and then you get out of what you get from there being different from their experiences, right? Whether it's educational experiences or living experiences in a different country or what kind of industry they came from or what background they grew up in. My view is by all means do all the right things to ensure that disadvantaged communities or groups of people or gender who have had years of discrimination, fix those. But in the process, don't lose the higher goal, which is you really want around you people who didn't have the backgrounds you have, didn't have the education you have, didn't grow up in a similar family, didn't go to the same kind of schools, because then you're going to get the power of the collective uniqueness of your people. What you look like and where you came from doesn't matter. What really matters is what do you do and how do you do it? With what commitment, with what? Do you bring your heart and mind to work or not? Do you do it the right way as compared to the easiest way? Do you do it because you want to get to the end? Do you do it care because you care about how you get to the end? That diversity is the diversity I'm looking for. That's what you're referring to when you hear me talk about the power of that diversity for this company. The advantage of having scale is only an advantage if you genuinely have scale. If what you have is a global footprint where each part of that footprint requires you to recreate from scratch, you don't really have scale. You just have a large, complicated global company. We are all operating that through one single platform globally. It's one release. And what's interesting is one variant of that release. It has releases in the course of the year two or four, depending on what's going on. And all we ask is that all our institutions that issue our accounts, our cards, banks, catch up with the releases once a year. So that basically every year, when we start the year, we're all in one release, one version. The power of that is enormous. So when I invest in comprehending how to use biometric technology for identification, so I can make it safer and easier and not force you to remember a password so you can identify yourself, you know, just identify yourself with biometrics if that's what a country wants. 
Once I do that and develop it, and I put it into the core underlying release, by the end of that year, 30,000 banks, 215 countries, everybody's got the capability. We're 47, 48 years old. We're getting up to our 50th year pretty soon. Uh, but in fact, the IPO for the company happened all of seven years ago. It's the eighth year. And uh, if you kind of think about what the company felt like prior to the IPO, it was owned by a number of banks, like an association. And even that ownership wasn't globally unified. So you had ownership for Europe separately, from ownership for Asia, separately from ownership for Latin America and the US. You effectively had different fiefdoms of ownership within this otherwise unified looking company in terms of brand. That kind of changed. And my predecessor worked his way through that and actually got us to have all the regions come together and create one global company. So how does that impact you enormously? It impacts you culturally. It impacts you through the process of the IPO. It impacts your way of thinking and strategy. It impacts the kind of people who were employed here earlier versus now. So just let's pick some of those, right? Let's take people. Earlier, 60% uh, of our people were in the United States, 40% outside. Today it's flipped. We've got more outside than inside, partly caused by the fact that our revenue comes 60% from outside of the US, but partly caused by exactly what we were discussing earlier, which is the desire to get different points of view and different ways of thinking and different forms of innovation all into the company and kind of get it into your skin through an osmosis process and seep into your body.